So this weekend, this past weekend, we invited a number of people over to play a board game from 1959. Mm-hmm. Board game t- called Diplomacy, a game... Incredibly famous game. I'd always known it existed. I would argue it is not famous, but infamous. It is both. Much like well Illuminati. Known. It is it, a game it, that many people... It's not obscure. <laughs> ...will refer to as the friend breaker that I think most gamers have heard of, but few have actually ever played. It's a game that people talk about playing. They talk about that friend who played it. Maybe they saw a game of it at their local gaming con. I have known maybe 10 people in my life, including the five people from this weekend, who have actually played a game of Diplomacy to conclusion. Yeah, I've never actually played Diplomacy before, but I knew, you know, I had known that it was a game that existed. Uh, I had played once, and I didn't finish that game at our way. I knew generally what it was about, but I didn't actually know the rules specifically until very recently. So, like months the ago. internet said that the game takes about four hours to play. Wikipedia says the game takes at minimum four hours to play. All right. And the, the, box what does the box say? does not say. All right. That's weird. A box usually gives a time estimate. This is a game from 1959. <laughs> I, it's, it, not, right now, it's put out by Wizards of the Coast. It used to be Avalon Hill. Mm. It was designed by Alan B. Calhamer. I don't know anything about him, and I'm not going to talk about the history of the game. Diplomacy is a game that you've got to really be committed to if you want to play. Diplomacy is an ass-old game with ass-old rules. Yeah, it is clearly, you know, it is not elegantly, I mean, some things about it are clever, right? Uh, but mostly, the game is not elegant. It has many flaws. The rules have many gotchas and erratas. And it is not a smooth production and by any means. No, but- it seemed simple until the second round of the game when immediately... Everyone just made moves that created this circular clusterfuck that took us like 20 minutes to unravel, yeah. only to determine that the end result was nothing. Well, we think it was nothing. I still can't get it clarified. I want to play again by mail, but... I want to play again by computer. Before we talk about how diplomacy works, it's, on the surface level, it is a simulation of a World War One esque conflict, like a Franco-Prussian War, some, some t- something in that era. Yeah, and all the players are basically, war, you know, leaders of countries. Of dic- great powers. Dic- dictators. Great they, powers. Yes. So, you know, Britain, France, Austria, Turkey, Russia. Turns out none of my friends know what the fucking Russian flag looks like except me. <laughs> I do now. Yeah, you do now. Everyone does now. Everyone, I, I was like, all right, you think you know all the old flags, right? What's this one? France? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's red, white, and blue. <laughs> Doesn't anyone know that the white is in the middle to symbolize that the royalty was splitting the nation in two? No, well, I do now. But yeah, my problem was that it's like, you know, from, you know, most of my life. It's the just Russian the flag Soviet was not flag. a sickle. The Soviet flag was yes, the flag the that was. Yes, Soviet flag the soviet i Union. know because scott i knew that the soviet flag was not the russian flag but it's just i rarely saw the russian flag yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And nobody knew austria or italy or anything it was kind of amazing yeah <laughs> but, i used to know flags more than i know them now actually if you believe me which but you don't the game have is to. actually a very apt simulation of the diplomacy surrounding world war one because we played for five hours and 28 minutes and at the end of that time it was a five-way draw. Yep. And everyone was dissatisfied with the result and basically saying, if we played more rounds, I would have invaded X. Yep. <laughs> Leading directly into World War II. All right, so basically the, the way the game works and the thing that's clever about it, right, is that everyone has units and every unit is worth exactly one. It's not like Risk where you can get a numbers game. Like, aha, I've got 40 attacking your five, I win. It's You got one. You can have at most one unit per space and no army has a power different from one. Yeah. So if I attack Scott in Silesia and he's in Silesia... It's one-on-one. I bounce back. Nothing happens. Yep. No one gets defeated. No one gets destroyed. Just nothing. Now, what he could do is he could attack with two, which would then eject me. But it doesn't kill me. It just makes me retreat to a different open country nearby. The only way I would die is if there was no open country nearby and I was trapped. Then I would die. And the thing is, you start the game... With only, what, three units? and Russia, Russia gets four. Russia gets four. So you have barely any units. And you control supply centers in your home country. And if you control one, at the end, you know, you, every other turn, you'll get 
units so that you or lose units so that you have a number of units equal to the number of supply centers you control but said reinforcements can only come out of where you originally started so even if i control 17 of those fuckers i can only get new units in my home country yeah it's pretty basically the game makes it such that unless you're already dominating like unless i've already taken someone over and now i've got two countries you know worth of guys uh, my, you know, the ability, my ability to influence the game just based on my own decisions of where I'm going to move my units and what orders I'm going to give them is basically nil. You can't do anything on your own because you have so few units and they're all equally powerful to everyone else's units. You can't do anything. You, so here, you can't win the game just by sitting there making decisions like you do in every other board game. So here's where the game departs radically from what most people expect from a war game because it is really a negotiation game, a diplomacy game. Hence the title, Diplomacy. Yep. One, everybody has, you have 15 minutes between every turn to talk. Go walk away. Talk you can do whatever you else. want. Go out on the balcony. Go into the bathroom. Go outside. SMS someone. Doesn't matter. At the end of that time, before the end of that time, you have to have written down the orders for all your moves and put them in the hat. Yeah, or box or whatever. The orders are all revealed and done simultaneously after the fact. Mm-hmm. Now, secondary to this, there are no binding agreements in the game. The game is a non-cooperative game. Yep. You can make all the agreements in the world, but nothing binds you to You can write up treaties. You can pretend to have a UN. You can do all sorts of stuff. We did form a League of Nations and had two uh, meetings in the, cor- in the context of the game yeah. <laughs> to decide the future of Europe after we, the, uh, the inevitable horrid stalemate yeah until i eventually betrayed my allies russia and uh turkey yeah asshole you deserved it completely deserve ineffectual it turkey i wasn't ineffectual you were completely ineffectual i wasn't ineffectual i was very good no you weren't you were terrible <laughs> but basically the other big thing about the game aside from the you know aside from what i just told you is that the only way to really get anywhere is to coordinate your moves very exactly. Yes, for example, let's say I want to attack uh, Rem here, right? And I'm attacking him from Constantinople to, you know, Budapest, right? And that's the move I'm going to make. And I need some help from my buddy in Russia. My buddy in Russia wants to support my attack on Budapest. He has to have a unit adjacent to the place Scott is going to attack, and he has to script not attack, but support... And then the unit he is supporting and where it is going. So on his sheet, in order for him to actually help me win and attack Rim and hurt Rim, he has to write on his sheet, unit in whatever place he's in supports attack from Constantinople to Budapest. That's, he has to write that, which means he needs to know that I am going to make an attack from Constantinople to Budapest, which means I need to tell him that. And he needs to... So now I'm giving him information... That means I need to not lie to him, and he needs to actually be faithful with our alliance or and go through with it. he already talked to me and said, look, I'm really on your side. Let's eliminate everyone else and then let's vote for figure a draw. Out, yeah, let's figure out where is Scott's either going to attack in this place or that place. I'll pretend I'm going to help him. We'll figure out which one of those two places is. Then we'll know to support the defense of that place. No, and, forget and that. I'll support, the attack to, I'll support an attack to cut off the support and dislodge your supporting unit, thus causing the attack to bounce back and messing up all your plans we have to coordinate all that in the span of the 15 minutes and if you do that to cut off the support it'll make it look like that russia did was trying to help me and it's complicated if i'm trying to coordinate this with my ally and my allies trying to fake out scott i mean you only got 15 minutes and if i go off to talk to him on the balcony all secret like Scott's gonna know something's up. Yeah, you can just look around the room, and you know you've got all the, all that me- all the stuff that's meta in other games, right? Like, oh, I see how you're holding your cards. That means you. That stuff is meta in most games. In diplomacy, that is the game. At one point, I wrote down, "I will betray Scott this turn," and I put it in the hat. And I was gonna hand the hat to the people I needed to communicate this to, who were who you know were up supposedly on the opposite alliance, and that was the best way I could come up with to not let Scott and Richard know that I was about to betray the ever living fuck out of them. Yeah, one time, so people tried to attempt to hide the hat. That was that was clever. That was clever and hilarious. Yeah. 
Uh, it didn't work. Though. I mean, the rules are if you just if you're not back, you don't put your orders in. All your units hold. They just sit there. Yeah, I mean, my orders were complete when by the time ran out, and they just because the hat wasn't there. That does that doesn't mean that you know. <laughs> the you other can't just like punch the guy. Like, I, I, yeah, that I, was I, the I, thing. I was thinking. I was like, why don't we just punch people and tie people down? And it's like, well, the thing is, if you do that, then the game really is just be, doesn't. It's not diplomacy anymore. It's just boxing. It's who is the fifth strongest man on. Europe Island. Yes, yeah, so you sort of have to be like, all right, nobody can break real laws while playing the game because otherwise it just breaks down. There's no point. Yep. You know, you're not gonna, you can't lock someone in a room or knock someone unconscious or drug someone. Now, the because... final important aspect of the game is that at any time, any all the players... No, there's two aspects. Aspect number one is at any time, any player can quit. Yeah, you can quit. Which is something you, we talked about in our panel, yeah. Losing Should Be Fun. It's within the rules. Very you, you few can games just, have an ability for a player who's not having fun to just leave. You can just leave. If it's too much for you, if you're if you're tired of it, maybe you got hosed and you're ineffectual and no one likes you anymore and you don't have it in you to try to make someone... You know, it's like, I'm not powerful enough, so no one even wants my help, right? And there's, they, there's really nothing I can do to help them. And I'm so weak that I can't be effectual on my own. I might as well quit. You can quit gracefully. The game allows for it. But you don't want to because the only way to end the game is either one person has to control 18 supply centers. You start with three. That is basically impossible. Unless other people just let you. Or if you have an ally, you roll and you keep playing for a long time, you could eventually get there. But the instruction book even says, the official instruction book says, if you win that way, you are playing it wrong. Or you're playing it right and all your friends are stupid. That's possible. So the way to end the game, really, is a vote among all players who have any number of military units still on the board. Even if you have one unit left on the board, you get the same number of votes as everyone else. Even on if a unanimous vote, you end the game and everyone who voted shares the draw. Everyone who did not vote because they were not on the board loses. So even if you've got one unit left and some other guy has 17, another guy has seven, basically everyone has 17 or less and you have one and you all vote, you win just as much as those guys with 17. Now we were playing, you understand, for the championship belt, yeah. which is a thing now in the crew dating back to the time of the vision and That's the it. bamboo. That's correct. And we ended up taking a picture of all five of us holding the belt. And what really happened was five and a half hours into the game, you know, we come down to an alliance of three and an alliance of two. And the alliance of two was doing really well, but they couldn't, they didn't have the momentum to push through and beat the alliance of three, even though they had a huge advantage due to early game stuff. Yeah. Well, we actually, you know, Operation Invade Italy probably would have succeeded in significantly damaging the uh, the Alliance of Two if you hadn't betrayed me on that vital turn. Ah, but you could have waited one more turn, and while we both Operation would have been. Operation Invade Italy was going very well. You realize that France's Operation Invade Austria was about to begin, and had I com followed through, t I would have taken Italy and lost Austria, thus losing my ability to make new units. That's fine and dandy by Turkey. <laughs> Yeah, and then you would have lost an ally, and you would have been done. No, because down it, once I once we had Italy, we could have then retaken Austria on the next turn. You I were don't thinking, think you could have. You were thinking too short term. Also, I was pretty much the most powerful person in my triple alliance because of the nature of the game. I had significant power. I just couldn't extend my power. But I had more due units. I had more nature. units in a more centralized place and a more secure border. The only real threat to me was France. I had all, I actually had more units than you at, at many points in the game. My problem was yeah, that early on. And the you know geography what? of Turkey made it incredibly difficult to uh, exert my force over great distances. You know what? Early on in the game, when you had more units than me, that's when I was allied with you. Yeah. And I was okay with that. Yeah. Notice how as soon as I had more units than you, betrayal. Yeah, jerk. Part of it was that Russia was doing the best possible thing. It just turned out that Russia and England were very expertly countering each other. Yeah. And they are basically at a stalemate. Meanwhile, Turkey was at a stalemate coming around Greece, and I was at a stalemate. France was incredibly too strong, and me and Rim had to team up to even hold him back. And we were starting to make a little bit of progress pushing him back. But it was so slow. In, and in the process of doing so, we almost took Italy if we had one more turn. But in order to take that Italy, Rim was going to leave his Austria open. And you realize that the double alliance, the allies, had been constantly offering me 
great benefits to turn over power to them and join their alliance. Yeah, but basically that was another problem, right? Is that, you know, England and France teamed up 100%, had absolutely no betrayals. As, they, as is the smart thing to do in this game. Yeah, they were a complete lock together, absolutely never betrayed each other. They left their backs open to each other and not once did they attack each other in the Indefatigable. Now, you know why? I betrayed you because remember two rounds before that we had our brilliant plan. It was our last ditch. I had that one army that was going to try to scootle under the bottom of Europe and pop out behind him and just conquer like all and of it, Africa. And it didn't work. Yeah, that didn't work. Yeah. So then I betrayed you. Yeah. But they, the two of them were an equal counterbalance for the three of us. So I decided that if I joined them, we could roll you and then the game would end and the three of us would share victory. Uh-huh. Here's where the fundamental problem with the game of diplomacy. The two, two fundamental problems. Three. <laughs> Fanatical devotion the to the comfy Pope. comfy chair. Problem the one. <laughs> at minimum, well, not at minimum, at maximum, every turn takes 15 minutes plus resolving. So about 20 minutes total. Yep. Say I had joined them in their alliance and it's three on two. The three strongest players against the two weakest players. Victory is assured. But it was going to take us about four to five turns to actually get into a position to eliminate uh, Turkey and then Russia. Which would then, you could have voted unanimously for a three-way victory, but, which would have right. been preferable to a five-way victory. So five turns to take out Turkey, two more to finish off Russia. Seven turns times 20 minutes. Uh, yep. Because Scott and Richard, Russia and Turkey, being intelligent, rather than quitting if their utility is to share victory, would wait 14 minutes and 59 seconds every round to turn in their orders of support, support, hold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it would have been incredibly difficult because of the geography involved for you to actually break those support holds. No, it would have been pretty easy. Because there weren't enough adjacent territories. Yeah, there were. You'd have to take them pretty much one or two at a time. Yep. So it, You so, couldn't take like five in a big sweep, no matter how, how close so you push. So that's the problem. War weariness is simulated brilliantly in this game. Mm. War weariness actually happens because at five and a half hours, we were actually literally weary of the war. Extremely. And the people who were winning voted to share victory with Scott because it wasn't worth another two or three hours of our lives to, to destroy him. I mean, it would have been worth it if it was going to be like, you know, if someone who was close to scoring an individual victory on their own might have been worth it to spend another hour to eliminate all remaining four players. France could have. But to get basically two-fifths more victory divided amongst three people, so two-fifths divided, so two-eighths, an extra court 25% of, I don't know, is not a lot of extra victory that you're getting there. But at the same there. time, this is... Part of the reason why I think the game is in many ways brilliant. It, just by us playing, played out almost exactly the way World War I played. Absolutely. It, it fought to a stalemate. Eventually, everybody gave up. There, was, there were some nominal winners and nominal losers. But every single nation thought in their minds... If I just had the chance to continue the war, I would totally win. Well, World War II is coming up soon. Don't worry. Yep. This is a sequel. <sighs> so the, the other thing that... The you second know, problem with the game. Yep. The rules... Suck. Are just... Say, it took us about a turn to run into very difficult to resolve situations. And in the instruction book, they have all these different examples of co things that can happen that might cause you know conflicts where you won't know what to do. And it tells you what to do if they happen. The thing that happened immediately was not in those rules. And I was like, what the fuck? There's so many possible erratas here and ways to handle weird situations. How did we so quickly in our first game on the second turn get a weird situation that is not in the book? What the fuck? And we didn't know what to do, so we just sort of, you know, sort of figured we should, you know, le let it be a standstill because it sort of made sense. And it probably, that may have been very well the correct thing to do in that situation, but I can't be 100% sure. And that drives me crazy in a board game where I, I'm trying to figure out the rules and I don't have a solid answer. Puts an asterisk on the whole thing. It's like, yep. oh, oh my God. But uh, to be fair... Every gamer should play... If you're a board gamer, you should play Diplomacy. You've got to know. If you can find people who play it with you. You have got to get friends to play. Get a full seven people, schedule a day, and be like, we are playing this motherfucking game. Now, a lot of people say it's like the friend killer. Someone won't be friends with you, blah, blah, blah. And in a way, that is, you know... At first, you know, before I played the game, I was like, all right, 
you know, anyone who thinks that obviously is such a shallow person with anger issues. I mean, you say issues. the same thing about Illuminati. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, I thought it was like, okay, you say it as a joke, you know, but it's like, I was playing the game. It was, you know, at times I was a little bit grumbly. It's just like, uh, you know, just that was the, actually mm-hmm. like, I think you felt a little betrayed because no one saw my betrayal coming, which well, I did I point out. Actually, during that turn, while, you know, I noticed that that was one turn where you had not let me see any part of your order sheet. Uh, and also you were sort of looking around and poking and not saying much. So I was like, I was guessing. I'm like, oh, is he going to betray right now? So when you did, I wasn't at all surprised. I was just sort of like, oh, oh he did. Yep. Uh, it had to happen. But it wasn't that, you know, I was grumbly before then. I just didn't, because the game makes you feel grumbly because you're so ineffective all the time that it's not that, you know, it just puts. France and Britain were terribly effective. They were, but I was. No, we weren't. So it just, the game can put you in an unpleasant mood very easily. Uh, I would, I would, I would do think, though, it's only a friend killer if you're really not friends to begin with. Yep. And you're really immature and sad. Uh, another thing about the particular game that we played is we only had five people. Because which someone didn't some make it. Two ponies uh, didn't show up. Yeah. So One of the ponies really should have come. He would have had a good time. Yeah, so there are two. Basically, it, when you don't have... Si- if you have six people, right, <laughs> only what, Germany, Italy's empty? Italy, if you play six players, Italy is neutral and all its units I think that would have been that would have been okay, but the major problem was that Germany and Italy were both neutral with Which a five-player game. would have been fine. Except what happened was the, uni- the unified alliance of France and Britain went straight east and just destroyed Italy and Germany and swept them. But meanwhile, Russia and Austria, RIM, right, they I went straight for you. They went straight for me in the bottom right corner, which made it much easier for France and England to come straight to the right unopposed. And there wasn't anything pushing back on them because nobody was playing as Germany or Italy. As a result, in over the first two turns, they got significantly more power. No, they got their power. They didn't actually take Germany or Italy in that time. They took it way later. They got all their power from taking Africa and Spain. Yeah, which were completely empty. And, you know, no one was able to stop them. Maybe if some pony had been able to get a fleet out there. How was I supposed to get a fleet out there? You, I had to use my fleets to defend against you and Russia. You, I went down to get my fleet out there, and your jackass attacks from behind kept me from getting out. You might your attack my attacks from behind because, you know, if you had just left your back unopened, I wouldn't have taken it because I'm all honest and not evil. But I needed Until the, the third turn. I then needed I Greece taken the- to have my access out through the Adriatic Sea. <laughs> and this is the thing. The geography of the game is real geography. Is real geography which makes it incredibly difficult and painful quite often. You know, in a lot of games, geography is often convenient. It's like, all right, you... Spot, geography is very convenient if you're Britain. But no, think of a game like Vinci, right? In Vinci, the geography is often extremely convenient. It, it rarely causes you trouble, right? It's always like, you know, some is better than others, but it's like, oh, there's a mountain there when you need it to be a mountain, and there's a, you know, there's always a good spot, right? In diplomacy... There's only one spot, and it's awful all the time. I don't think it's that bad. I think it's just more realistic. It is. It's incredibly realistic. Geography is awful. (laughs) Which is, you know, the other games have maps where the geography is, you know, designed for a game and is not awful. So, at least in our game, somewhat ironically, Italy and Germany were partitioned by the greater powers. Mm. (laughs) I just found that kind of beautiful in a way. It was really fun. As exhausting as it was, it was really fun. And I do want to play it again. I think I would only play... I want to play... Well, it has to be seven It people. has to be seven. I can't play with the five. That's not going to happen again. I, I want to play it at least one more time also, with seven we, people we, in we, person. We, I do think it's fairest to choose your starting countries randomly, but I really did not like being Turkey. It was, I would have rather have been Turkey than Austria. You probably also would not like to be Austria. I would much rather... In a seven-player game, I would love to be Austria. I would I would much rather be Because France. I would ally with Germany and Italy, and we just go all out. That's possible. I would like to be France or Russia uh, if I had a choice. I wanted to be Russia or Britain, to be honest. Because Britain, I might, I might, I wouldn't mind being You know how we either. could do this? I do you, sort of feel, though, that like Britain is just the opposite Turkey. On the, Scott, it's just, here's how we do it. Everybody writes down the country they want to be. Okay. Secretly. We reveal them. If no one else wrote the country you wanted, you get, you get it. it. And then for the people who contend, we set up a system where they can't get the one they wanted. So anyone who wrote down a country that someone else wrote down, they have to write down another country that can't be the one they just wrote down two seconds ago. Yep. And then we have to have an exception for it comes down to two people. Coin. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think that would work pretty well, actually. But if it comes down to two people, that means it's two free countries. Yep. And unless they both want the same one, which is maybe unlikely. Who knows? But yeah, definitely, I would only play again with seven people. So what I'm going to do, one, probably so sometime that there aren't week. all these easy pickings. And the worst part, I think what made it more frustrating, is that being Turkey, all the easy pickings were not adjacent to me. They so were like, if you'd gotten a fleet out. No, I had to. I would have had to go Tunis. through you to get to Italy or... Tunis! That's not. I'm not talking about the easy pickings that were just empty land. I'm talking about the easy pickings of Italy and Germany. They were not that easy. But they weren't. You you were adjacent to them, and I couldn't get there. Yeah, and you know what? I didn't have the, the strength to attack them. <laughs> well, France and UK sure did. Yeah, later, <laughs> after Any- they'd already conquered the entire Western world. Yeah. Anyway. Well. Not- anyway. Yeah. But I think what I'm gonna do is <laughs> I posted a link to the that online diplomacy that looks pretty good. So after I sort out a bunch of Geek Nights work I have to do, I'm going to start up a seven-player play-by-internet game with, like, 48 hours for turns or something. Mm. Like, something ludicrous. It'll be a long-term game where everyone who wants to play can play idly. I think that'll work better than what what's that other game we played? Uh, Neptune's Pride. Oh yeah, because Neptune's Pride was a lot of how often do you check it, and it was a lot of numbers. Scott momentum Johnson game. always would brilliantly attack people at like three in the morning. Yeah, I mean that is the one thing about diplomacy, right? Is other games, you know, give you the option to ally or th- you know make deals and things like that, right? And or, or trade and you know like risk or you know shogun samurai sword shogun well not- remember there's two kinds of games there are cooperative games where deals are a part of the game like dune yep and those are not that realistic from a war standpoint they're not only realistic if you're doing like a commerce simulation mm-hmm. but non-cooperative games like risk where there's no way to make a binding deal are more fun and more realistic from certain perspectives but at the same time because it's a game and not the real world everyone's gonna get their ass betrayed in the end well the thing with Ri- the thing is right so dune has binding deals right which means that you use the in-game mechanics to enforce your alliances it is so a you- cooperative game so you don't need to diplomacy you don't need to actually do real diplomacy stuff right you don't need to because it's in the game the worm comes up you can ally with someone and you're, you're good yeah it's not really you diplomacy don't to- if you can prove that what you're doing is what you did yes at the same time risk while you can make deals free form and risk the same way you do in diplomacy diplomacy and they're non-binding uh you can enforce basically there's a numbers game in risk that beats that totally dominates any deals that you make so it doesn't merely matter what deals you make in risk because numbers win i got 10 freaking units here you got one that doesn't deals don't matter because i can win just with the game mechanics i don't need to win well more importantly it means that if i want to enforce deals i have to one be a shrewd diplomat and two have the ability to enforce the deals or punish people who renege on the deals within the context of the game. Yes. Like, if I make a deal with Scott, like, we're now a double alliance, we're going to do X, and Scott betrays me, I have little choice but to punish him with my own units or convince the rest of the world to help me, like, sanction him. Yeah, but in diplomacy, right, because every all units are equal, so you can't win with the game mechanics alone, and the deals are non-binding, you actually have to legitimately actually convince people in the real world for real in order to make any progress, which few other games have that. Or you have to not convince them, but con- but have trick them into thinking that you have convinced that you, you have think to d- that you have convinced them when really you know they're going to betray yeah. you and you betray them one Basically, round by any means necessary, you need to get them to write orders on their order sheet that are the orders that you want them to write on their order sheet no matter what that means is and i also know several times multiple people cocked up complicated orders yeah which is actually pretty accurate to real warfare especially in that era yeah i mean napoleon tells marat to go somewhere and that's the wrong place well bomb uh, the wrong place huh? yeah <laughs> at the same you know it's, it reminds me a lot of, of traders of genoa now just called genoa which is a game where you can trade anything for anything you know there's a lot of games that have trading like settlers you know encoded in the rules but in traders of genoa you can trade anything for anything using any means you want you can make futures markets you can you can come up with any scheme you want uh and do it which is you know sort of like diplomacy where you can diplomacy in any way you want and there's not too many games that actually pull that off very well So, diplomacy. Yep. 
it's it's a game that you should play, especially if you have an interest in game theory, World War One, diplomacy. Yeah, it's a very it's a very important game historically. Uh, you shouldn't. I don't know how if you should you know invest a whole bunch of your life into it, but you should definitely play it once or twice, learn about it, know the rules as much as they can be known. Some people do. Some people get way into it. There Some are people do get way into huge tournaments. But you know, it's important to know you know the way that you know Star Wars is important for a film person to know. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brand OK for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.